Comets are like cats. They have tails and they do what they want. Comet C2019 Y4 Atlas held major promise that it might be a possible great comet, becoming naked eye viewable sometime in May of 2020. Unfortunately, like many comets have done before, Atlas broke apart and quickly faded. Dirty snowballs from the outskirts of the solar system sometimes don't survive the furnace that is the inner solar system. Cyanogen gas begins to escape at a faster pace. Water ice begins to sublimate to water vapor. Bursts of these gases can break the comet into pieces from within, especially smaller, more rubbly types of comets. The same outgassing is what makes comets look so beautiful as they swell in size. But that outgassing can also sometimes signal that a comet is entering its death throes. And just in case you thought this was rare, Comet C2020 F8 Swan did the same thing just a few weeks later. It too showed promise that it might become a naked eye visible comet. And it did so just briefly for Southern Hemisphere viewers, before disappointing us all and fizzling out. I did three videos covering mostly Atlas Y4, but also Atlas Y1, Panstars T2, and Swan this spring. So check them out if you want to see how that played out for us, and maybe you'll get some better context after this video. And before I talk about C2020 F3 Neowise, Let's lay down a few ground rules, shall we? Comets themselves are tiny, but their tenuous gas clouds can be measured in millions of miles. That doesn't make it the size or a multiple of any planet or even comparable. Comets aren't some planet X. Comets are common. There are dozens observable right now. Most of them are just very faint. You likely only heard about Comet Atlas or Swan because they showed some promise, and then they failed. And maybe the third time is the charm. Only this time, it looks like Comet Neowise might actually hold together and become briefly appreciated with your own two eyes soon. Comets are not harbingers of doom. They don't cause pandemics or gloom. Yes, and that means Atlas, Swan, or Neowise. None will interact with Earth by any appreciable size. There will be no debris, none to hit Earth. Not this summer from any new comet. The Perseids were already there. I have more to say about them if you have some time to spare. EMPs from comets? You get your science from where? Please don't make me vomit. Roses are red, but not neowise. Atlas is dead, no matter how hard a YouTuber tries. Comets don't cause solar flares, nor trips down the stairs, or addictive wares, or fish in pairs. Angels didn't save the earth from the comet's non-existent dread. No one shot it down. No one thinks that but a clown. Please, let's just put this to bed. It wasn't blasted by a laser cannon or some nuclear weapon. It isn't Baphomet or some demon. Aliens, if we knew any, they wouldn't care. If you just watched a video about comet disaster, they aren't making you more aware. Don't at me. After all, you're all still here. So just relax and enjoy a possible sky show in July. And let's just stick to the facts. Comet Neowise arrived in the inner solar system from behind the sun, from the Earth's perspective, and just below the plane of the solar system. As a result, at first it wasn't viewable favorably for the northern hemisphere and didn't brighten until it was already hugging too close to the sun to be appreciated much from the southern hemisphere. Neowise is rounding the sun very close and was just recently viewable in Soho's coronagraph. Because it's so close to the sun from Earth's perspective, it's basically impossible to see without special telescopes right now. Like Soho, a comet's brightness is a function of how close it gets to the sun, how much water vapor and cyanogen and other gases escape, and then how close it is to Earth. In this case, it's going to be bright because of how close it is getting to the sun, and it never really gets all that close to Earth as far as comets go. That also means it's going to dim very quickly after leaving the sun's vicinity. I'm finding it hard not to rhyme things now by accident. <laughs> However, there should be at least a narrow window where Neowise might be visible to the naked eye in the evening twilight sky in the northwest by mid-July. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be tricky at first. For people in the Northern Hemisphere, the glare of twilight is going to keep this comet difficult to spot. Neowise will be as bright as magnitude 1 or 2 early on, or for comparison, that's roughly the brightness of most of the stars in Orion. While that's pretty bright, it's no match for evening or morning twilight. Still, it might be worth checking out. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it'll be around July 6th when it should start to be a good time to get out and look about an hour after sunset. And if you're a morning person, there should be a few days in July, between the 6th and the 14th, where you might be able to spot the comet in the northeastern sky during morning twilight. Unfortunately, most of the stars in the vicinity of Neowise are going to be hard to spot as well. So the hope is you'll be able to find a smudge low in the sky in the northwest an hour after sunset. Neowise is, of course, escaping the sun. So your best bet is to just look above the brightest part of the sky after sunset and see if you can find it. Now, while Neowise in reality will be shades of white and light green, any brighter object like a setting moon, distant lightning, or clouds visible 
just above the horizon, or nearly lost in evening twilight, is going to appear a bit rusty colored, just like pan stars did in 2013. So Neowise isn't special in that regard. If you live in the far north, but not so far north that the sun doesn't set for at least a couple of hours in the month of July, then you should be able to watch Comet Neowise all the way from dusk until dawn in the northern sky. By late July, Neowise will finally start to escape the glare of twilight, but at the same time, it will have moved pretty far away from the reflective light of the sun and outgassing will begin to slow down. It's going to dim quickly. By August, southern hemisphere observers can catch a glimpse too, but by then, Neowise may have darkened so much, it will probably require at least a pair of binoculars, telescope, or long exposure photographs to locate and appreciate Neowise. There is a sweet spot though. The most perfect time to catch Neowise, assuming it behaves for us of course, is around July 15th. Best case scenarios place Neowise at about a magnitude 2.5, or a 4 on the lower end. At this time, the comet should still be visible to the naked eye after the sky has become totally dark. There won't even be interference from moonlight either. And while you shouldn't need to locate stars to find Neowise if it's this bright, you'll find the comet somewhere between the northwestern horizon and the bowl of the Big Dipper. At the very least, I'm hoping that Neowise will be a great target for photography. So start practicing some nighttime photography with the equipment that you have right Right now. Stick with me though, because I have some fun astronomy musings for you. Here is Your Astronomy Sucks, number two. Bad astronomy takes in news, comments, and movies. Fix for fun. Or maybe I should have called this one Your Armageddon Sucks. Oh man, what a great topic. I love this movie. But here's the big problem with Deep Impact's initial premise. The movie starts out with a kid and his love interest looking through a telescope at those two really close stars in the handle of the Big Dipper. Mizar and Alcor. Actually, hold up. The writing in this scene is an astronomical disaster. Mizar. It's a double star. Good. The one next to it? Uh, Alcor. Good, Peterman. And the one next to that? Uh, I don't know. It's McGrath. It's south. About 10 degrees. They go on to argue about whether a smudge near Mizar and Alcor is Megrez. But Megrez is two stars away on the handle of the Big Dipper, and telescopes of this type don't have anywhere near a 10 degree field of view. Yeah, it's probably a satellite. Let's uh, take another picture, we'll send it to Dr. Wolf. Yes, sir. And satellites in this part of the sky would be hauling butt and moving quickly out of the field of view. Definitely not stationary like this. Anyway, if you needed any evidence there was some shoddy or just ignored consulting work done for this movie, here it is. They take a picture and send it to Dr. Wolf at Made Up Peak Observatory, who then confirms this little fella as an uncharted comet. Oh, hello there, little fella. Nowadays, with the many worldwide sky survey programs we have, it would be really hard for a kid to be the first to discover a comet with a backyard telescope at a star party. But honestly, not terribly far-fetched for the late 90s. Now in the hands of an astronomer, he's got just two data points, somehow an exact to the arc second RA and deck location from a kid who found a smudge and took a picture with his film camera. And one new observation from Dr. Wolf a couple days later who can calculate the comet's latest position. This is absolutely not enough information to calculate an orbit, and way too soon to panic about your mail server being down and getting yourself killed trying to inform the world. At minimum, we need three or four exact measurements a few days apart to get a general orbit with some generous margin for error. That way we can see the position change and also the change in velocity from one period of time to another. Better yet, we should get dozens of positions from dozens of observatories over several days before we go too crazy. Already by then, much of the astronomy community and even amateurs now know the comet's position, brightness, and a fairly precise orbit. No government organization is really going to be able to put that cat back in the bag. Moreover, even if they could initially, a kid found a fairly bright comet with a backyard telescope. So many other amateurs and enthusiasts are going to find it and start crunching the math as this comet approaches the inner solar system and begins to brighten, long before we've got some grand government conspiracy taking place. And all of this was just as true in the 90s, but even more so today. There's really just no good way Way for governments to hide potential impacts from asteroids or comets. This is just freely available data that is just not in their hands in the first place. I've been getting tweets today, a lot of people wanting to know after Wednesday's scrub, uh, why do they select this particular time? I mean, you think, wouldn't it be better to do it in the morning when we don't have all those 
storms. Mm -hmm. Great question. I've been getting that as well. Up to four vehicles docked there at one time from three different countries. So you got to consider traffic. And then you also have to consider the astronauts on the space station are working and living there. So they got to sleep. So they don't want to mess with the astronaut sleep schedule. That makes sense. We need Trooper Steve to give a traffic update on going <laughs> up to the space station. Uh... Launch windows to the International Space Station are hard. But let me see if I can help explain it. Think of it like this. You want to go for a jog with your friend at the local track, but they got there first and they're already running. So if you want to jog together, the conventional thinking is that you wait for them to come around the track and then you join up with them as they pass you by. But orbital mechanics adds on an entire new layer of complexity. Instead of waiting for your fellow jogger to come to you, the jogging path itself is oscillating relative to your position on the ground. With launching spacecraft, you instead wait for the path to match up to you. Then you hop onto the track and take the innermost lane relative to your jogging friend so you have a shorter path. Then you can play catch up with your friend or space station. Let me show you in Kerbal Space Program using a space shuttle. The concept works the same whether it's the shuttle or the Crew Dragon. Changing your orbital inclination is far more expensive on fuel than just hopping on the inner track. Once you've matched the track, it's time to play catch up by speeding around in Earth orbit just inside the orbit of the International Space Station. Once you've caught up, perform a few correction burns. And it's time to link up and dock with the space station. Add to that, the spacecraft's initial launch has to be ascending so as to keep the spacecraft's initial launch close to abort and landing scenarios and probably occur during the daytime too since this was a first human launch in quite a while and on new hardware. You don't want the space station to be on the opposite end of the jogging track either so it doesn't take days to catch up. So put it all together and these one second windows to launch to the space station are typically a few days apart. In a striking coincidence, the 2020 summer solstice will occur on the same day as a major annular eclipse. More than a coincidence, Incidents, cue the apocalypse hype. So apparently eclipses care if they land on a solstice or an equinox? A total or a nullar solar eclipse fell on the summer solstice four times during the 17th century. And we've already had one in my lifetime, June 21st, 1982. And we get another one on June 21st, 2039. So I guess if the world doesn't end this year, it's got 19 more years to redeem itself. Or if that one doesn't work, we've got June 21st, 2373. June 21st, 2392. Ring of fire style annular eclipses happen about every two years or so on average. It just means that the solar eclipse is happening at the moon's apogee, or furthest distance from the Earth in its orbit. And in my opinion, they're not nearly as cool as a total solar eclipse anyway. Oh great, another garden variety meteor shower making the rounds. Why were there even published stories about the Lyrids this spring? Do media websites just pick one random meteor shower each year to hype up and then just copycat each other? Probably. In August of 2020, probably the best meteor shower of the year, the Perseids will peak in the late evening and early morning of the 11th, 12th, and 13th of the month. The Perseids last for several days, with weeks of ramp up on either side. The moon is after its third quarter phase during the peak in 2020, so seeing all the wonderful Perseid meteors will be relatively easy until the moon comes up really late at night, well after midnight. There can be as many as 120 meteors per hour, stacked on top of the normal background meteor rate of about 20 per hour that exists most of the year. Trust me when I say this, if there's one meteor shower to watch any given year, especially without the interference of the moon, the Perseids are always worth it. So why the heck do we get bombarded with news articles about the Lyrids, the Torids, the Eta Aquarids, when most of these minor showers produce barely more than the average background meteor rate of 20? What I really hate to see are newcomers to sky watching becoming numb and disappointed by weak sauce meteor showers or super red blood wolf moons and the like. Perhaps it's a slow news week when this happens. Either way, there are two meteor showers each year you should care about. And unless there are special circumstances that might enhance a different meteor shower over its normal paltry rates, the Geminids and the Perseids are the ones you should actually care about. There's June 21st, 2411, June 21st, 2430. Oh dear God. Let's see. Telescope named Lucifer. I'm uneducated about Bible prophecy. Some smiley faces, the Luciferians, FEMA, New World Order, 14 executive orders, Federal Reserve, Georgia Guidestones, baptizing aliens. Okay, that one might actually be a joke. Creature from Jekyll Island, Stonehenge, and a Microsoft patent application. How the hell did you manage to pack all of this in one comment? But at least you said, now I dropped a number of facts on you, so it's going to be tough for you to reference me as a conspiracy theorist. <laughs>
I could go lots of directions with this, but I need to try and stay on topic here, undermine the whole premise, and keep this fun. Lucifer is the Latin word meaning morning star, more specifically, Venus, when it appears in the morning, or more literally translated, to bring light, or light bringer. In a way, it's an ancient astronomy or mythology term, and using that sort of thing is a common practice when scientists name projects or spacecraft or instruments. And often that means going crazy with backronyms to try and force a piece of tech to have a cooler sounding nickname. But no matter, the Catholic Church and the Vatican City have historically run observatories close to home. But the Vatican is in the heavily light polluted heart of Rome. So they built the VATT telescope in Mount Graham, Arizona. But the Max Planck Society collaborates with a different observatory in Arizona, also on Mount Graham, called the Large Binocular Telescope, or LBT. Attached to this other telescope is an instrument, or sensor, which was named by some people with an apparently twisted sense of humor. The Large Binocular Telescope, infrared spectra- Anyway, it's a backronym for Lucifer, and probably the flimsiest one I think I've ever seen. But that's also part of the joke. The Max Planck Institute later changed the name to Lucy probably to avoid upsetting their Catholic neighbors. Of course, not before this sense of humor got into the wild and led to some conspiracy theories. So there's no telescope named Lucifer, and the Vatican doesn't have anything to do with the instrument named Lucifer. Now Lucy. If you specifically search for a Catholic telescope in Arizona named Lucifer, all you'll come up with are conspiracy theories and fairy tales. Funny how that works. Thanks for watching. I hope you're enjoying this series and have learned something new along the way. Leave some comments, but especially let me know if you've got a lead on some crazy or poorly written astronomy news, wherever you might find it. Do the thing if you want, and until the next one, clear skies, and I hope I'll see you out there. June 21st, 2802, June 21st, 2764, June 21st, 2821,